Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I urge you to take your seats? I'm Malcolm Rogers, Anne and Graham Gund, Director of the Museum of Fine Arts, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to the museum today on behalf of the trustees and, of course, also all my colleagues at the museum. A big welcome. It's an exciting time to be in Boston. Those of you who haven't been here for a few years will have noticed changes at the MFA, and there's quite a lot going on at the moment. But also, you'll have an opportunity to see the ICA, which is still new for us, and also um, Renzo Piano's uh, great project at our neighbours, the Gardner Museum. A lot to see and lo a lot to do. I th wanted particularly to thank AAMC President Carol Eliel and Director Sally Block and all those of the AAMC Board of Directors, the Conference Committee and the invited speakers and special guests who've worked to make this conference a great success. I also wanted to acknowledge today uh, some of my colleagues, past and present, who've given their time and talents to your organization. As members of the Board of Directors, Rita Freed, Elliot Davis, and Erica Herschler, and I know they're here today, as well as George Shackelford, who was your president from 2006 to 2009, and we still miss him here in Boston. Well, as you explore the museum, I'll hope, I hope you'll discover just how much we've worked to rethink our historic building, our whole campus, and indeed our programs, especially our exhibition and rotating programs. All the while, I believe, maintaining high standards of excellence. Let me know if you find something that isn't uh, working. At the, at the heart of all we've been doing, and a number of people this morning have said to me they hardly recognize the museum, at the heart of all our endeavors are extraordinary curators, and it's a great pleasure to acknowledge that. I hope you'll have uh, a chance to enjoy current exhibitions and installations, Alex Katz Prince, Seeking Shambhala, Beauty as Duty, the Lure of Japan, and Edward Weston, Leaves of Grass, and that's just uh, a selection from what's on view here at the moment. I also hope you'll have a chance to see one of our uh, latest and certainly largest acquisitions, uh, the Roman statue of Juno, uh, the largest Roman statue in the United States, discovered in a Brookline garden not so long ago, and now in our ancient world galleries on the second floor, about to undergo surgery. As part of our most recent fundraising campaign, I am especially proud of the new curatorial positions that have been created and the existing curatorial positions at the museum that have been endowed. Among them are several firsts for museums of our scale, the Kaplan Curatorship of Jewelry, uh, the Phillips Curator of Judaica, uh, the Lauder Curator of Visual Culture, and uh, the Sadler Curator of Provenance. But we've also seen the endowment of curatorships of musical instruments, uh, design, and contemporary decorative arts. Uh, in total, 21 curatorships have been endowed for the future in the last campaign, and a further six since that campaign ended. The curatorial profession has, I believe, changed dramatically over the past uh, few years since I was working last as a curator myself in, a, in London. Uh, work in general, I sense, is more collaborative, more connected, and we, of course, are all looking to, for eager philanthropists to support our work. There's never quite enough resources uh, to fund our dreams. But I must say, as, as a director, as director here, it's my passion to find those resources to give everyone who works at the museum the most meaningful career uh, possible. The only thing I'd say is that the role of the museum in contemporary culture is evolving rapidly. I've just recently been lecturing in Ox at Oxford University in England uh, about museums in the 21st century, and one of the critical things seems to me getting used to the notion of change accelerating and also used to the notion that we don't know quite how things will be in 2050. Technology is a huge influence and also the flatness of the globe. And all I'm saying is keep an open mind and prepared, be prepared to embrace that change. So welcome to Boston. I hope you find the sessions really rewarding. I know that you'll find the networking really rewarding. And it's now my pleasure to introduce your president, uh, Carol Eliel.
Thank you, Malcolm, and welcome to everybody here to our 11th annual AAMC meeting and our first in Boston. Um, before I start, I would just ask everyone please to silence your cell phones so that we don't have weird beeps and music playing. And um, also, as we go along during the day, you'll notice that there are two microphones at the front of the auditorium, and one on either side. So when we have the Q&A sessions, please just line up and use those microphones. We're not going to pass around mics, um, but uh, people won't be able to hear your questions if you don't use the mics, so please use them. Um, we are truly thrilled to be here in Boston. Um, I know personally I am, um, particularly since for many of us this is our first opportunity to see the new and expanded and wonderful Museum of Fine Arts, um, as well as many of the um, new and expanded colleague, museum, colleague museums in and around the city. So thank you to everyone from Boston who has welcomed us in such a hospitable and, and lovely way. In the interest of moving our program along in general, we have included full biographies of all of our speakers and participants in the meeting packets that each of you got with the registration tags. And I will thus be very brief in introducing our, um, what I am calling our keynote conversationalists this morning. Um, as a bit of background, in discussing and planning the shape and content of this annual meeting, the conference committee, our conference committee, felt it would be valuable to foreground issues of the local and the global, the encyclopedic and the focused, um, since those are concerns I think that all of us face in doing our jobs as curators. We also felt that it would be more productive to consider these issues in the context of a conversation rather than a more structured keynote address. So we are thus extremely pleased to have uh, Helen Molesworth and James S. Snyder with us today, each of whom will make brief opening remarks and then segue into a conversation format, following which there will be time for questions from all of us. Helen Molesworth is the Barbara Lee Chief Curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art, the ICA, here in Boston, where we will be meeting on Tuesday afternoon. During the course of a long and lauded curatorial career, Helen has also worked at the Harvard Art Museums, the Wexner Center for the Arts, and the Baltimore Museum of Art. She has organized um, numerous very exciting, interesting, and provocative exhibitions, generally in her areas of interest, which include the problems of feminism, the reception of Marcel Duchamp, and the socio-historical frameworks of contemporary art. Since 1997, James Snyder has been the Anne and Jerome Fisher Director of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, the museum has expanded in almost every conceivable way under James's watch, um, including its exhibition and collection activity, its endowment, and its incredible network of international friends, and perhaps most salient to today's program, its recent campus renewal and expansion project. Prior to the Israel Museum, James was deputy director at MoMA. So please join me in welcoming Helen Molesworth and James Snyder. Sniffly, I'm sorry to say, but I'm okay. How are you? I'm fine. Oh, I'm, is my mic on? It's morning, mine everyone. on. Yes. <clears throat> I'm fine. Thank you. That's great. Adjusting to the time zone. Yes. Yes. So, do you want to um, do you want to go first with your statement of sure intent or not? <laughs> I think it would be, I, I would love it if you went first. Okay. Uh, Helen and I have discussed, I think we are each delighted not to give a long keynote. A challenge that I have for audiences that aren't so familiar with the Israel Museum is that in order to give you a kind of landscape for the issues that we're going to discuss, I do need to try to pack into 12 minutes, really, a lot of visual material which I will do and try, to try not to talk too quickly, but I hope that it will be beneficial for laying the ground for what we really want to talk about. So if you like, I'll go first. Okay, that. that'll be great. I'm, I'm going to sit over there so I can I see. I think you should. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I use this. Okay, great. So anyway, it's really nice to be here with all of you. 
I know a great many of you, you know I'm American and that for 15 years I, I, I walk under the cloud of what's called a foreign national. Um, which doesn't mean that I'm not often in the company of Americans, but rarely is it the case that I get to sit with a whole group of American professionals. So I don't have to explain what I mean as often as I have to explain what I mean in other settings. So I'm touched and delighted to have that be the case today. First, I do want to thank Sally Block and Carol and the executive committee of the association for asking me to participate in this conversation with Helen. Um, I also want to say it's a pleasure to be in Malcolm Rogers' reinventing house. We've been colleagues for a really long time. And as we begin, I want to congratulate Helen. She got a cold this weekend because she received an honorary doctorate at the Maine College of Art. So she's now, she's now a doctor of art. And in the course of it, got a cold. Congratulations. Helen, I'm delighted to be your conversant today. Those of you who know me also know that I'm sort of a dyed-in-the-wool museum person. And something that made me that a very long time ago was the idea that a focal point for me has always been the notion of where landscape and architecture meet, where they intersect in a way that ignites powerful place. The notion of a powerful place having a special, special meaning as a backdrop for a museum setting. Because somehow, somehow, in the course of being in a place where landscape and architecture do really give resonance to a setting which is about the experience of material and visual culture, makes that experience always that much more powerful. And that has a great to do with what I always talk about and what I've thought about throughout my career. And actually, I think it has a great deal to do at least with one of the subjects today, which is the idea of museum invention and reinvention in our time. As I said, because not all of you know the Israel Museum, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about it and showing you some images, simply to give context to what our discussion afterward will be about. Um, First of all, to tell you about the it, for those of you who don't know, know it. Um, many of us are older than the Israel Museum, which was only founded in 1965 by an amazing man named Teddy Kollek, who if you don't know him, just think about Thomas Jefferson and transport him to Jerusalem. That's Teddy Kollek. Um, in 1997, I became director of the museum. By that time, the museum had grown from 50,000 square feet sitting majestically on the top of a hill to 500,000 square feet sitting majestically on much more of the top of that hill, uh, comprising over half a million objects, being encyclopedic in reach, beginning at the beginning of material cultural time, and coming to modern and contemporary art in a very, very impressive way, and with a very remarkable world constituency supporting the development of this place. Uh, when I saw it first, being the first time in my life that I ever set foot in the land of Israel and in the city of Jerusalem, which was in the spring of 1996, the museum was barely over 30. Uh, by that point in time, it truly had become a comprehensive museum in art and archaeology, it did sit in a setting which was so impressively about the synthesis of landscape and architecture that it made a kind of unique statement in terms of my thinking of what comprises power of place for a museum setting. And in a way, for me, it was kind of the mother load of what that subject was all about. As I spoke to colleagues then just arriving, they would say to me, we are proud that we're many museums under one roof. And what I said, looking at the potential of that place, was that in fact, they might have the potential singularly to be the one place in the world where you could tell the universal narrative of the unfolding of material cultural history from the beginning of time to the present in a very, very special place. And in a way that might also have the potential to be the most powerful such setting anywhere in the world. Every issue of regional culture in the context of universal culture, of the ta challenging texture of local, national, and international con constituencies 
mixing and mingling in one place. The meaning of contemporary in the broader context of historical for all of these kinds of questions, and I think they're the ones we want to discuss this morning, this place could be one-stop shopping. I fast forward to the middle of 2005, by which time during my tenure, we had tested to the limits the notion of how you might take objects from different periods and different cultures across the timeline and across geography, put them together, see if they resonated in valid ways and in illuminating ways for a museum audience, and we decided then to embark on a renewal, a reinvention of the museum, and we also decided that because we sat in a very special place in the world, we should try to do that renewal and that reinvention according to parameters that would be a bit different from what many of our sister institutions were doing around the rest of the world. When you come to a place like the Museum of Fine Arts and you hear, as we just heard Malcolm do, use a, vocabul a vocabulary not dissimilar to mine, you realize that not all museums march in lockstep in this regard, and some of us really do think about reinvention counter to a trend. It's an exciting thing in a way, and in a way we'll also hear from Helen yet another story about being counter to that lockstep. For us, the issues had to do with the power of the museum's architectural legacy and its historical setting. We have a magnificent original. Our architectural bones are great. And anything that you would do at the Israel Museum needed to resonate with that pre-existing, but to do so in a way that with a light touch would also say, this is a new signature, and the new signature is about identifying a moment in time when reinvention occurred. Secondly, one always hear talk of expanding. Carol used the term expanding relating to us. Carol, we didn't expand. We preserved the scale of the pre-existing museum. For us to hold on to our envelope, to hold on to our footprint was extremely important. The idea of expanding galleries, expanding public area within that frame was the priority, but not expanding the frame itself. Third, and perhaps most important, is the notion of preserving the spiritual dimension of a place. The Israel Museum struck me the first time that I saw it as being about beauty, serenity, and composure. Those words became our kind of mantra. Some of you have been to Israel. Sometimes it's not so beautiful, serene, or composed. But our place was and remains about those characteristics. And finally, and this is perhaps the most important point, the notion that whatever we would do would be driven by the concern for enriching content, that content should be the focal point, that we should endeavor in what we did to try to become an opportunity for a singular experience of telling a universal narrative that unfolded from a million and a half years ago to the present day. To quantify that in terms of being counter-trend, our idea was to stay within a pre-existing footprint, a pre-existing envelope, and yet expand our galleries, double them from 100,000 square feet to 200,000 square feet for collection galleries alone. And to re-engineer 100,000 feet of a legacy of not such great architecture that followed those great original bones and have that be new architecture that would resonate with the original, that would address issues of approach, entry, service, movement, and enable the pre-existing great to be all about collection galleries and all about content. Also, unlike most of the museums where you are here, although there are over 350 museums in Israel, there really is not another like the Israel Museum. We are the main statement museologically for the country. So the idea that we would go through a period of reinvention and not be available to the public was unacceptable to us. No one else had to come and tell us that. So we decided that in a very compressed 30 months, we would rethink the entire museum. And in an equally compressed 30 months, we would execute the reinvention of the museum and that we would stay open throughout that time and let our audience experience the pulse of that change. We also decided that in a country which is a little bit small, 
and where modesty should obtain as a signature that we would accomplish all of that change and spend only a hundred million dollars. Around here that doesn't sound like a lot of money. There in a way it's not a lot of money but we simply thought it needs to be possible to show the world that it's possible to do a major reinvention of 300,000 square feet out of a 600,000 square foot museum building and to do it with that level of funding. And our idea was that in the, in the end, our message should be one of an accomplishment of grandeur, but where the subtext was modesty. Finally, and this is perhaps true a bit more there than in everyone's experience here, the idea that we would do this as a collective initiative, because we were not growing the museum, we were not building new buildings. We weren't going to name new buildings. So we went out and we asked our friends worldwide to support a hundred million dollar renewal of the museum without naming anything. And so together, 20 friends of the museum, before we got underway, committed the hundred million dollars that would allow us to accomplish that. And they are recognized as you enter our campus for being responsible in the year 2010 for the, re for the, for the renewal of the Israel Museum. Now I'm going to show you some images, and there are a lot of them, but we'll do it really quickly, but it's simply to give you a sense of what, at least in my mind, and I hope I haven't become sunstruck in the 15 years that we have been living in Jerusalem, of the power of this place and the beauty of this place. You're seeing what is the classic elevation etched in everyone's minds and memories of the Israel Museum being its east elevation, here set against the western setting sky, that stone that you see is actually Jerusalem stone, which is actually a pale, warm, golden stone, but at this time of day, this was shot at the summer solstice, it reads with this incredible opalescence against a deep red sky behind. And what you see here is classic international modernism. It's in everyone's minds is what we are all about. What's remarkable about this place is that it's one of the few examples in the world where an architect's first notion in a one-to-one -one correspondence became the reality of the place. What you're looking at here is Alfred Mansfeld's first sketch, thinking about an Arab village situated on a Jerusalem hilltop, converted into a kind of classic international modernist modular design, replicating the notion of that hilltop on that hill crest, and this was done in about 1958, and then you see in 1967 the reality really bearing this one-to-one -one remarkable sense of correspondence from a source of inspiration to inspiration to reality. And again, this is the view that you all just saw taken less than a year ago, and it's stuck in everyone's minds as what this place is about. This is the reality of that place in daytime today, uh, stretching across a campus which is, is 20 acres in circumference. Here you see an overview, and if you go back to this just for a moment, what you think about is this idea of ordered international modernism cascading along a hillside. Maybe you know that its reference is an Arab village on a hillside. Only once you've started to learn the vernacular of the region do you know that's the case, but there it is. And yet its reality is indeed that it grew the way that an Arab village would grow organically across a site or setting. And this is the campus as it is today. If we rotate that just 45 degrees this way, it's a little bit remarkable. And here you can understand the kind of confluence, the serendipitous confluence of amazing architectural input that made it the thing that electrified me in 1996. The original architect, Alfred Mansfeld, was born in Russia, trained in Germany during the Bauhaus period came to Palestine in the late 1930s and brought international modernism there. His idea indeed was to use a modular vocabulary, make Mesian uh, glazed pavilions, except given the light in the region, he needed to clad the exterior walls of those pavilions with Jerusalem stone on the outside. Later you'll see form cast concrete on the inside. And the expression of international modernism being a floating roof suspended and separated from non-supporting curtain walls is only read 
through this articulation of a clear story of glazing between a concrete roof slab and a clad curtain wall here. So this is Alfred Mansfeld coming from Russia to Germany to Palestine to bring international modernism to the Mediterranean. Here is Frederick Kiesler building the building to house the Dead Sea Scrolls. Frederick Kiesler, of course, coming from Austria, ending up in New York. This being his only permanently executed project, it's a kind of statement of metaphorical expressionist, modernism, a different language from Mansfeld's. And then here you see Isamu Noguchi designing the seven-acre formal sculpture garden setting for the museum. Again, Noguchi coming from Japan, ending up in California, another language of of modernism in its moment, really the language that would lead us to art that uses environment and the landscape. What struck me as amazing with, without knowing any of this at the time is that what you're seeing here in Jerusalem in the center of the universe on the top of a hilltop, the idea that you can have this kind of merging of different strains of modernism kind of electrifying each the other coming to rest on this hilltop site. This is what rests under this, which is what we are today. What you see here in yellow is this notion that the reinvention of the museum was not about changing the envelope, expanding the envelope, or expanding the footprint. It was rather about rebuilding some uh, not very well done temporary buildings from the 70s that related to nothing about this architecture, uh, addressing formally in a clarifying way movement from a, a formulation for entry uh, service, retail, special events, information, and circulation to the center point, a new center point for the museum, a new set of temporary exhibition galleries under a pre-existing plaza, and otherwise everything pre-existing. So the architecture for the, re for the new architecture was done by an American named James Carpenter. I hope some of you know him by now. Our idea was to pick someone that no one knew so that it wasn't about using an architecture, an architect with a uh, pre-existing uh, signature for museum architecture, but someone who would be willing to subordinate to pre-existing and who also would nonetheless be able to make a subtle new statement of signature for renewal of the campus. So Jamie's work is all of this work from service and circulation to a new central entering place a firm in Israel called Efrat Kowalski, which addresses historic modernism in Israel, dealt with the re-engineering of the, the entire uh, interior of the pre-existing museum campus. Just to show you for a moment, if what ought to have been strong about this and what was on day one in 1965 was a sense from entry to Acropolis of this amazing ascent to a point from which you would begin an experience of culture when these temporary buildings were built puzzlingly, uh, that ascent was blocked from its front view, that promenade somehow became the trees for which you could not see the forest. Um, very important in our redo was to open all of that up. So this is actually Jamie's language, turning the original architecture inside out, making Mesian glazed cubes inside um, terracotta louvered exterior shade elevations that would mold and shape light as light comes into the museum, bringing the extension of this promenade as originally intended all the way from the outside to a work commissioned by Anish Kapoor to make a statement about the power of the site and setting and about um, the, and as a tribute to the uh, power of the accomplishment of the built museum. Um, because this is a remarkable expression of movement up and is a thrilling experience for those who could handle a part of the mandate to Jamie as the architect of new architecture was to create an alternative to taking that path. We gave him free hand to create a, a barrier-free on-grade passage that would follow the path of the promenade under it that would bring you from the front of the museum to the center, that would not be about architecture, that would rather be about the notion of the experience of moving through a built environment, that would be about light, that would be about beauty and composure and serenity being our mantra, that would lead you to a work specially commissioned from Oliver Eliasson that would pay tribute to Jerusalem light, this being a 360 painting, painting uh, each of those two and a half inch wide 
um, paintings that comprise the 360 being the next color in the spectrum of Jerusalem light that the human eye could detect and that could be painted in, in uh, oil paint. In terms of, of identifying a new central entering place for the museum, again, we wanted to go away from the notion that you hire an architect who drops a signature down onto a pre-existing architectural statement. And Jamie, by preserving the geometry and the scale of the pre-existing, by inverting his exterior elevations instead of using this Jerusalem stone to block the light, and preserving the clear story, doing a Mesian kind of glazed cube uh, enclosed in, in a louvered shade house that would mold the light that comes into the interior space. And for us, an achievement was the sense that with landscape from Noguchi's garden meeting the central axis of the promenade, meeting this modernist architectural statement, you would sense something new and different resonating with the pre-existing, but it wouldn't be a jarring uh, disjunction with what that pre-existing is about simply drawing into that center place. Those few of you who have been to the museum might recall that if I speak about a kind of cascade of modular architecture that would replicate the experience of an Arab village on a Jerusalem hillside, that is not about open spaces and watermarks such as you see here. In order to accomplish this, we took a million cubic feet of bedrock out from the interior of that pre-existing envelope while preserving its materials, its palette, and its character so that we could have what we call the Cardo being the central place of the campus, allowing us to cluster around one central place, the entrance to the museum's three curatorial wings, being archaeology from prehistory a million and a half years ago uh, to the Ottoman migration to the east, uh, to the Islamic migration to the east at the end of the Ottoman period, a wing for Jewish world culture, a wing for the fine arts being Western here, non-Western to the right, our central auditorium, and just here where I'm standing, a 12,000 feet of temporary exhibition gallery, so that around this cardo, really the substantive uh, content-driven heart of the museum uh, um, exists. So this is just looking closer in, so the entrance to Jewish art and life to the Western fine arts, the non-Western fine arts, looking backward, the entrance to archaeology, again, feeling the way that Jamie's um, solution for not blocking light but shaping light so that you're always aware of the unique character of Jerusalem light outside. Uh, just quickly, entering the three wings, people don't read signs. No matter how beautiful your architectural signage is, and in our case, it's trilingual, it's in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. Uh, we felt that the statement at the entrance to each wing needed to be pretty obvious, kind of had to hit you in the face as you come in. So these are 13th century, uh, these are, are 13th century BC anthropoid sarcophagi. These are from the, mo they're from Gaza actually. These are from the moment um, when those Canaanites went into Egypt and Egypt and, and those early Israelites were kind of kissing cousins and the Israelites started to practice mummification and burial in sarcophagi. So that's sort of a nice subliminal statement for us, the idea that cultures kiss and that they coexist. Just to go in those galleries for a moment, this is in the Canaanite period just before monotheism, just before the 